Tracy Milligan is our moderator. Tracy, would you come up here and join me? Tracy is the chair of our women's committee, a board member, and she's the CEO and the founding uh, member of the Milligan Foundation, and she can tell you a little bit more about that. And uh, just to let you know, we'll have a, a time for question and answer, um, index cards, and we will also have a time for a performance at the end and a reception. So we invite you to stay on if you can. Mick, here we go, Tracy. Great, thank you. Thank you all so much. So good afternoon and welcome to the International Women's Day program of the uh, excuse me, United Nations Association of San Francisco. Um, it's really great to see all of you here this afternoon. Um, as Mary said, I'm Tracy Milligan. I'm the founder and executive director of the Milligan Foundation, which is uh, an international nonprofit that works with victims of domestic violence and human trafficking. So I just wanted to say that I did this program, or I came up with the idea for this program for Justice for Women, because justice for women is such a hot button issue right now. Women are really making significant strides around the world, not just locally, but around the world um, in fighting for their rights. And so today, um, we have an amazing group of people who have spent their professional lives as trailblazers in business and law and advocacy. Uh, so with that said, our first speaker, Letitia Taylor. She is the CEO and founder of Health Measure, a wellness platform that healthcare providers and corporate employers can use to assess and coach employee well-being. And she's also the Global Partnerships Director for the United Nations with their Women's Entrepreneurship Day initiative. She has traveled the country setting up Women's Day, Women's Entrepreneurship Days in major cities across the United States, which include uh, Idaho, New York, Chicago, and of course here in Francisco. So I'd like to bring Letitia up. Tracy, thank you for having me. Mary, thank you for putting this together. I think that this is a phenomenal um, event, and I'm honored to be here. In fact, last night I was preparing for the presentation, and I have to admit, I was kind of nervous. I do a lot of what Tracy does when I'm putting on programs for women entrepreneurs around the, around the globe and around the United States, and so I'm used to moderating, and I thought, oh wow, I actually get to share my opinion. This is going to be an interesting talk for sure. So we'll be in for an exciting 10 minutes. But it got me thinking, what I was asked, what I thought I would do is I would walk you guys through a little bit just understanding um, from a business perspective what my company is, what we do. And then I want to talk about some of those problems that entrepreneurs face. And then I really want to talk about what we can do together to bring forth a community that really empowers and supports women as they go through this journey. So that's what we're going to do together. So when I thought about it, the whole reason I started my health tech company is because I wanted to be a homeowner here in the Bay Area. And when I see this quote, it reminds me of everything that I think San Francisco embodies. It's better to fail in originality than to succeed in imitation. And that's why people come here. I feel like this really is the heart of what San Francisco is in general. And so I had spent 10 years working in biotech and healthcare and was introduced to a technology that won a Nobel Prize that was developed by the National Institute of Health to be able to measure and assess nutrition and supplementation utilization. And so I thought to myself, you know, what if we could solve this problem? If we look at our healthcare system, 
we already know that 70% of the diseases that exist are actually lifestyle traces. There's been numerous government education programs talking about whether it's five a day or seven a day or nine to 12 serving of fruits and vegetables a day that we all need. But what is apparent is that um, knowledge does not dictate compliance. And when we look at the, our ability to be able to influence people, there's three ways that that happens. One is by talking, kind of like I'm doing right now. Number two is by sharing an experience or a testimony or an example. But the thing that's more pow the most powerful is somebody themselves having an experience. And that's why in healthcare we tend to see that, that the sicker patients are the ones that are actually more motivated to do something to change. Everybody likes to say, well, I don't feel sick. I said, well, that's great because you don't feel your arteries hard thing, do you? <laughs> And you don't feel loss of bone density. We don't feel these things. So when I saw this technology, I thought, oh my gosh, what if this is it? This right here is a way that we're able to, in less than a minute, be able to provide that experience. It's kind of like stepping on a scale for the first time. But the most important thing is that it changes behavior. Let me show you a little bit about how we've done that. So we work with three groups of healthcare providers, or three groups, three different segments. We work with healthcare providers. So first and foremost, uh, with this was a use case that we had with over 5,000 patients, OBGYN pregnant patients out of Chicago. They are, were Hispanic patients, basically kind of, um, they had a, a mattress bank account, just to give you an idea of kind of their social economic stat stature. And we were able to not only just, we were able to measure and show them where they were initially, and then after changing what they were doing from a uh, diet and nutrition perspective, and then what they were doing from a supplementation perspective, we were able to measure that outcome after five years. So on all four of these data points of being able to actually impact our direct healthcare outcomes is where we were able to exceed and move the bar. Now we don't just work with people that happen to be in healthcare. We actually work with fun people too. So we've been working with the Golden State Warriors for the past five years, before they won their first championship season. And these people that are, you would expect to be at like the peak of their, their fitness and their health. And we went in there and we assessed them. And as a team, audience participation please, as a team, you're, you need to guess, the test parameters go from zero to 100,000 and they're broken out in increments of 10,000. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and therefore. As a team, where do you think their, their group score was? Oh, and by the way, on this test, higher is better, so you want to have a higher number. 90. 40, 40, 80. 20. Because what we're really assessing is that they're obviously in great physical condition, right? They can run, their cardiovascular systems should be very well. But what we were looking at was we were looking at how much nutrients they were absorbing from their diet. And the truth is not very much. And so we started working with them over the course of six months, or the healthcare providers with Health Measure did. And uh, we changed their diet. They started juicing two, three times a day which is an expensive habit, but they did do that, and they took some high quality supplementation that we were able to help them vet out to make sure it was exactly what was listed on the back. And six months later, the trainers came back and they said, here's what we've noticed. Here's what we've tracked, is that their recovery times are better, they uh, have less injury, and that their inflammatory process is improved, it's lower. And so after they won that first, and that's why we heard them all be like, oh, this is the healthiest team in the, in the league, healthiest team in the league. But um, at the end of that season, the C-suite level executives came in and said, wow, this is the best thing that we did for the team this year. And that gives you an example of what you do in really healthy people. And then the last is with corporate wellness. We did a small pilot program out with East Bay Mud. So you can think, these are like middle-aged men that really don't like to be told what to do very much and are pretty rough and gruff, and I can say that because all my uncles are kind of following that demographic being from Idaho. 
and um, went in and were able to educate them and came back and were sh able to show that we, were, we decreased that inflammatory process, and so they negotiated better reimbursement rates with their insurance companies. So on a small scale, this is how this works, and I always say, imagine how it would be on a larger scale with us all working together. But like every health tech company or every company, we had a few challenges. And I just want to talk about how we addressed those. So first, we started off this 10 years ago. It was an uneducated market. Let me tell you, when I say, like, when I read that quote earlier about it's better to fail in originality than to succeed in imitation, I am telling you, nobody had any idea what we were talking about, <laughs> including kind of us. But that was part of the fun. Healthcare providers in general receive anywhere from two to four hours of nutritional training and that's it. So you can imagine while we were talking, we weren't actually really having a true communication. So how we overcame that is we had to find somebody that had almost a dual, dual education, one a little bit in uh, Eastern medicine and one also in Western medicine. And the previous medical director at Alta Bates had started the first integrative medicine program. And so we started working with him. To date, the medical director now is doing clinical studies at Highland Hospital, being able to show how this technology, along with acupuncture and supplementation, is actually helping to lower pain in patients across the board and lower their ability or their need for having to use opioid use, which dramatically impacts our community. The second thing with the technology is that it wasn't very user friendly. It took about an hour and a half to warm up and I'll never forget this one day when I went to this office and it had a long cord like this and Rose ran off of a, a Dell Mac computer and the nurse tripped over the cord five minutes before it was complete. Needless to say, we don't do business with them. <laughs> So anytime when there's a technology issue, you need to raise money. We put another $250 million into it and did some more clinical studies. So it's now small. In fact, I even have the device in my purse over there. It's about the size of a football. So it's portable and it's, and it's uh, extremely easy to use. But the third is the one that I really wanted to focus a little bit more time on. And I know when we sit on the panel, Tracy's going to ask about business obstacles that we had to overcome and how to do that. But I want to talk about relationships. And this is more on a personal note. My husband uh, worked at Stanford on the Human Genome Project, cloning and sequencing uh, DNA, which we have a, a genetics platform with our company. And uh, when I got started, he said, are you sure you want to do this? And I'm like, yeah, I think I want to do this. I think we can help a lot of people. And there, were com there would be comments like, well, you know, maybe you should learn how to draw the molecular structure of a, of a molecule. And today, just so you know, no one has ever asked me to draw a molecular structure of a molecule. And it, and it went on, like, and it, you know, just these little comments that people make up, up over and over. Needless to say, that relationship ended. But what I want to get out of that, oh, I, that he's now my ex-husband, but what I want to pull out of that, uh, out of that conversation is this, is that we're going to hear from people that, um, work with people that have been through human trafficking, which is a very emotional, like alarming, impacting thing that happens to you from just a, an occurrence, right? But it's our day-to-day -day communication is what actually makes a bigger difference. And so I've been studying communication because I think it's the most valuable thing that we do. And so whether you yell, at, whether you communicate and yell at somebody drastically, or you do not communicate at all. The thing that bothers people the most is the small comments and the lack of celebration when people accomplish something in their life. And so as I thought about sharing that story last night, going back and forth like, should I talk about this, should I not? I woke up this morning and a woman that sat on one of my panels up in Idaho for Women's Entrepreneurship Day is a small business owner. She owns a restaurant. She said, you know, in light of International Women's Day, here's, I'm gonna share a little bit more than what I normally do. She's like, there's not a day that doesn't come in that somebody says, are you the owner? Is the chef your boyfriend? That's the person that owns this company? Who's taking care of your kids? Oh, you must have plenty of backers, financial backers. 
And so what that reminds me of is, and I use this analogy, it's a little bit like waterboarding on an entrepreneurial spirit every single day. And that is the thing that messes with people's psyche more. And so if I've traveled around the country, what I've noticed is that the thing that we can do together is have International Women's Day, is have Women's Entrepreneurship Day organization, where we bring people together in different sectors, whether it's politics, whether it's healthcare, whether it's technology, and we create an empowering and supporting environment that we cheer for them and celebrate for them and empower them in their failures and in their successes. Because imagine, if you really were Lady Gaga or, or Beyonce having somebody cheer for you at that level every single day, how much would you be able to accomplish? And so as I think of San Francisco as a community, I think it's a very transient city that people come in because they have a bright idea that they want to develop and they want to grow. November 19th is now officially Women's Entrepreneurship Day. I've been to some collective efforts with people that I work with and Mayor London Breed, and we will be continuing to further this organization. Um, to put it in perspective, last year the mayor in LA proclaimed the day, and this year they had 1,000 women that showed up to be a part of that program where they could learn more skills so that they could level up their ability to be able to provide for themselves, which helps alleviate poverty and it helps people make sure that you know they don't allow you know uh, sexual or violent crimes to happen to them. And so, as I think about this, and I think about the organization that we can do that we can build together, is that this is the thing I want to leave with: is that sometimes you just have to create what you want to be a part of. And that's the thing that I want to encourage and challenge us all to do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Leticia. So our next speaker is Heliana Utarti. She is the anti-trafficking program coordinator and community advocate for the Asian Women's Shelter. She produces trainings and social justice cases uh, related to domestic violence, trafficking, and anti-homophobia. Oh, come on up here, yeah. She does not want to be meeting people, but she wants her soul to be um, shared. Yeah. 
intend to send me home, but they never do. I don't know where to go. I cry in my room, hoping for a miracle, hoping they will remind me of the cat and remember me go back to my family. Saya bertanya pada diri saya sendiri, adakah jalan keluar untuk semua ini? Saya bertahan selama tiga setengah tahun. Saya sudah putus asa sekali. One day, when I'm walking in the dark, I meet a neighbor. I'm afraid to talk to her at first, but over the next few weeks, I see what is happening. Defense me, lawyer, who says she can help. I stare at the woman with me while my case and the killing are being heard. They give me a safe home and help me regain my confidence. Most of all, they give me back my home. So you probably have heard this kind of stories before, uh, and I think you know part of the challenge of my work is because individual cases like this. You know, this case was in a suburb of San Francisco, I think, in the city or Union City or something like that. It is actually harder to uh, to find because it's one person in one uh, big house somewhere in, in the suburb. And so, what's interesting about this case? Uh, her name is uh, I am is that um, she was helped by a neighbor, and then the neighbor took her to Delhi City, and then the neighbor actually made her work. So she was actually re-traffic. And although the neighbor found a lawyer for her, so the lawyer actually found us and said, can you take her out and bring her to the shelter? And that's when the whole thing. So it is so easy actually to be helped and re-traffic, you know? Um, I want to say that, um, uh, there was some part that was not clear, so she was living in a, uh, near the garage, and the, the situation was, was uh, three years long. Um, she is originally from Indonesia, where, where I come from, and that's why um, she ended up to be my client, because I uh, spoke her language. So, um, uh, what's interesting uh, you know, in her case also is that when she was brought to the U.S. from Hong Kong, so she was recruited in a, uh, in a legal workers recruitment agent, something like that, back in Indonesia, brought in, uh, into Hong Kong and worked in Hong Kong for two, three years and everything was good according to her. And they brought her to the US and then something changed. So if people often ask, why do people do this to each other? I don't know, you know, because you have extra money, because you are this, uh, who knows? Who knows? So I'm just going to um, talk to you actually today is what do we do at Asian Women Shelter and with other organizations that, uh, that's doing similar things. What do we do in day -to -day, uh, our day-to-day -to -day work to support them so that they become human again and they become, uh, you know, important uh, community, uh, community members. So just very quickly, um, uh, human trafficking is a big deal, as you can see. Uh, according to the Polaris project, in, 19, uh, in 2017, there were more than 26,000 calls. In San Francisco, we had more than 500 cases in 2017. Um, this is basically what happened. And uh, uh, our client actually went through being recruited, being harbored, and manipulated into uh, labor. Uh, a lot of our cases are mostly um, labor, uh, 
mix between labor and sex trafficking because when they are all alone in this place and they, they usually be locked in, they don't leave the house. And some of the traffickers can be your own distant family. And there's a lot of sexual harassment and, and rape at the same time. So it is, for, for me, it's sex trafficking and labor trafficking all mixed up together. I want to say though that uh, I am is doing well. This is a case about 10 years ago. And um, she is now the head, uh, one of the head cook in one of the kitchen of one of the big tech company around here. So she is not from here. She's doing well. And she actually manages her, um, what you call it, settlement money uh, very well. She was uh, able to actually uh, get herself a small house in Emeryville area. So there's also another challenge is once they get a big settlement, how do you use it? Because some people who never had a lot of thousand, then they'll just buy expensive things. And I don't know what to do with that. Um, let's see. So these are, um, this, um, sorry. Um, these are a lot of barriers with, that uh, my clients uh, you know, are facing. Some of them don't speak English, some of them are afraid of the authority. A lot of folks from uh, another country are afraid to talk to anyone. They don't believe the police, they don't believe anyone. They, don't, they are so afraid to speak to just anyone because they come from uh, countries where the government is very oppressive and killing their own people. So why would they believe Police. In um, in I am case, it was um, a little better for me because she spoke English and I was able to talk some more in Indonesian. So we actually built trust a little faster. Even though this is, you know, these are a list of things that I have to deal with every day. You know, they are fearful, they are distrustful. Sometimes they trust me, but they don't trust the lawyer. Sometimes they trust the lawyer, but don't trust me. <laughs> And then sometimes when uh, I work with somebody who, uh, who, who I don't speak their language, they don't trust the interpreter, but they, but, but they trust me. And they try to tell me all kinds of things that I don't understand. And it's um, basically, it's a teamwork. We have to, um, like, you, like you said, we have to communicate and support the client so slowly, together, all the time, so that we actually build trust and getting them somewhere. Withdrawal is a big thing. You know, the first few uh, few days that I met them, or the first few days they came to the shelter, they don't want to talk to anyone. They don't trust anyone. Um, health issues is a possibility. Some people don't sleep. Some people refuse to sleep. Some people eat and cook and cook and never stop cooking. And some people refuse to uh, to eat. So it's. Um, it's interesting, it's interesting, it's challenging, but once they um, went over the hump, it just feels, you can see a flower is actually blooming, and that's why I stay in this shop, and I can't do uh, anything else. Um, uh, facing community scrutiny or gossip is another thing, you know. Uh, some of our clients actually uh, would like to go to uh, the church and just, you know, start a new life, because that's what we are trying to get them to do. But then. People from her community or their community, you know, men or women, they also ask, how did you get to the U.S.? What's your visa? Are you married? All kinds of questions, you know, small things that, like um, Leticia said, is not celebrating who you are, but questioning who you are, and they, they got scared. So some of my Korean-speaking clients pretending they're Japanese so that they don't have to deal with other Korean people. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting. So, anyway, um, this is just to remind all of us that human trafficking, as well as um, domestic violence and sexual assault, basically what had happened to them is that, you know, they were in a situation where they were under power and control, and their own power was taken away. So, one thing that we do is what you, what, uh, what was said earlier is about empowerment, and one thing that we do is actually we tell them their options. These are your options. This is the kinds of thing we can do. This is the kinds of thing that I can do, but I cannot do that thing. I can do this thing, so they can make decision. You know, some of them might not want to work with us, want to work with another organization, and that's why. But we want to provide them with as much uh, information and education as possible. 
Um, one thing that I want to uh, highlight here is about uh, culturally informed and culturally appropriate. A lot of the organization thought that culturally appropriate meaning you should have an interpreter and everything will be fine. And that sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't work. Because exactly because you speak the same language, they don't want to have anything to do with you. Mm. So just because I speak Indonesian, I don't assume they want to talk to me. And just because I speak Indonesian, I, don't, I cannot assume that I know everything about that person. Because we come from a different education, different year, different experiences, you know. Somebody like me who, have, who speak English and have access to education and have some money experience violence very different with somebody who was tricked to come here, right? So, so that's one thing that we always try to uh, remind folks. And um, these are three things, um, just to close my presentation, these are three, three steps, if I may call it that way, on how we support clients. One is uh, stabilizing, as people call it, or um, basically providing basic needs. Um, uh, shelter is one thing, clothing, um, safety, healthcare access, and you know, seeing an attorney. I actually forgot to put food. How can I do that? Um, so at Asian Home Shelter, we're very serious about food. There are different kinds of rice because every culture has their own rice. Um, every culture has their own noodles. Uh, there's kosher food, there's halal food, there's this and that. And um, I did not quite understand that in the beginning. But now I can see that a little bit of comfort food actually help a survivor feel that they're human again. Because most of the time, you know, food is denied. And, you, know, the, you know, the food that they like is denied from them. So if you actually offer food that's pretty close to what they're used to, at least it helps them to feel at home. After a month or so, we usually get it ready to the taking off stage looking for, um, you know, getting them to a, a job training or find education uh, if they want to, understand their rights when they're working, and then understand some financial management, and find a, a workplace that's safe also. Because there are situations where they fall into a workplace where they are really exploited again. You all probably have heard about living nannies, living uh, elder care and stuff, they are always slippery situation uh, in there where possible exploitation happen again. I don't know if you want to call it human trafficking, but exploitative for sure. Um, the hardest part is, of course, uh, looking for safe and long-term affordable housing in San Francisco. So we are very lucky that we work very closely with um, several uh, programs in, in San Francisco, including Brandon House and. Uh, Clara House and stuff, and we also receive funding from the state to provide a subsidy for about six months, and that's really, really helpful. And finally, actually, this is the hardest part, is to support your clients to reintegrate re into the community, building new friends, finding um, new relationship that is uh, healthy, and, uh, you know, knowing you know, the neighborhood, the situation, so that they, they thrive. They're not surviving only, but they're thriving. So again, in this situation, we are dealing with another community scrutiny if they come from a small community. People will ask, who are you? How did you get your visa? All this conversation about T visa and U visa is like flying on the handle in the community sometimes. Um, so um, one thing that uh, we try to work with with them is think about who you want to be. Do you want to use your, uh, uh, your name? You want to come up with a new name? Do you want to come up with a new story? How do you get here? You know, do you want to know people? And who do you want to know? And stuff like that. So um, the length of work that I have with my client is usually uh, six months to a year until they feeling fully reintegrated into the community and not needing help on handling taxes and stuff. And then they're really, really, um, you know, taking off. Essentially, I want to say that we cannot do this alone. You know, I want to thank you all of our um, colleagues uh, in law enforcement, our attorneys, 
one of my support people here is Miss Nancy O'Malley, you're always helping us out. So basically, and you know, we need all of you to support a you know, person to, to not survive, but to thrive and really taking off and be successful. I think I stop here for now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for that. Um, that work is, is so important, and I know that because in my organization, I have worked with Haiti on who shared cases. Um, so next, we have cards coming around if you have questions, because we are going to do a panel. Um, so if you would like to have a card to write down a question, please just wave, hold up your hand, and a card will be given to you. Great. Our next speaker is Nancy O'Malley. She is the District Attorney of Alameda County and was the first elected woman in 2010 to hold the office. She is a nationally recognized expert on violence against women, sexual assault, stalking, human exploitation, and trafficking. Come on up, Nancy. successful and impactful agencies and thank you it was really a beautiful presentation that you gave and I think what you also did you captured the humanity rather than just telling the story um, so thank you for that <clears throat> um, I want to talk about a few things one of them is I, I am the first woman district attorney of Alameda County I'm proud of that fact and it's a change, reframe America. And I want to, some of the stuff I'll talk about today is how far we have come, which does not mean we don't have far to go, but we have really transformed a lot. And, uh, and just to give you a couple of examples of that, when I became the district attorney, there were five women out of 58 who were elected DAs. They're now 50%, which is in the country, nowhere else. <laughs> We have a lot of, you saw the last election, we elected so many women into Congress and into other uh, branches. The only place where we're really lacking still is at our state level, because we're still only about 30% of women in our legislature, in our constitutional offices, but we're moving, we're moving there. Um, and so I wanted to share a little bit when my first exposure about really understanding this, this uh, violence against women, which we didn't even call it that then, but when I was in college, I was a, a volunteer at the Rape Crisis Center. It was one of the first ones in the California and really in the United States. And all I saw of trying to support survivors was injustice. I saw a system that treated them badly, that accused them and made them think it was their fault or they did something to ask for it, that if they ever did have the courage to go to court, that what happened in court was tell they were cross-examined about every sexual encounter they ever had. It was awful. And I thought to myself, first of all, why would anyone go through this? And secondly, what can I do to make that different? And and I also worked at a volunteer at a DV, a domestic violence shelter, again, one of the early ones. And in those days, as we some remember, that they used to walk the batter around the block to cool him down. Uh, and then tell the woman that if she would just be a little bit more responsive or maybe not be so in his face that the violence would stop. And of course we know that's so far from the truth. So, so people like me, and I personally vowed that I was going to be involved in a system changing all of these paradigms around how women are treated. And part of that, uh, I'll talk really briefly about, but also it isn't just about changing laws. It's not just about educating community, those, those are essential, but it's also about having women in elective office or in positions of authority. Because there's a lot of research that has been done about what happens to government, what happens to society, what happens to communities when women ha are in positions of making decisions or drafting policy. 
And what we know is a couple of things. One, they're recognized as equal. Uh, that two, that the policies change around healthcare, around childcare, around social support systems, around all of the things that help us be whole human beings and not segregated into men are in charge and mostly in the old days white men were in charge. Uh, oh, and then women were relegated to keeping the house, taking care of the kids, and doing the domestic work. So changing, this is, a, this is a goal that we have, I believe we should all stay focused on, of making sure that women who, who have something to offer our community are women who are put in positions. The, the world back in those days of the violence against women really favored the men. They, as I said, they try to make women be at fault. Uh, and, and this was back in the 1970s. I'm gonna fast forward to about 10 years ago now when I took on a, a project in my own county to look at for how many sexual assault kits, you know, when a woman is sexually assaulted, or a man could be too, but primarily women. When women are sexually assaulted, and they go to the hospital for an exam, and they're able to do perform this exam and have a kit presented to the police. So I looked at my own county, and we were out front on DNA, and I was like the sexual assault queen prosecutor in the state. So I thought, what, five, 10, 1900. And that was my county. And so that led us to look around the country. And, and I share this is not so much about a story about me or Alameda County, but our own strength and our own power to be activists. It doesn't mean you have to be somebody of some notoriety or something, just be activists. And what we've done since that time is we discovered there are something like almost 500,000 forensic sexual assault kits that were never tested. They were never submitted to a crime lab by law enforcement. And I used to blame law enforcement, but I don't think it was law enforcement's fault because those are officers who investigate cases. The only person who touched that kit after the officer booked it in was a criminalist. So I started to blame the criminalist. But then I realized I can't blame anyone, let's just change it. Blaming is a waste of time. Like, you know, challenging people, let's just figure out what the solution is. So our solution now is over the last uh, five, six years, we now have over $170 million in the federal budget to have local law enforcement get all of those kids out of the property rooms and be tested. And the result of that is women who were treated like they were nothing, that we didn't have to give all of that we had for them to give bring justice or to respect them in the way and give them dignity, now know that this country is moving better in that direction. The, um, and so my commitment always has been, and I know all of you here because we're talking about this very important subject on this very important International Women's, I'm gonna call it month, uh, is that, that you know, we believe the truth is that violence against women is never acceptable, it's never excusable, and it's never tolerable. And it's also never the victim's fault. And that is an important message because when we start looking at little kids and little girls in grade school, they already start thinking that they have, they're lesser than, they aren't as smart, or maybe they did something wrong. So we really have a lot of work to do to get around that. The, um, I just really want to sort of um, add a little bit to uh, what we heard from Indiana about human trafficking. Because in the state of California, did not have a law against human trafficking until 2006, and we're the progressive state. The federal government created their law in 2000, or not, sorry, 1992. And so we just, California just copied it. And we couldn't get our legislature to change what the federal law was at the state level. Meaning they just said, whatever the feds say it is, is what California is gonna say. So we took it to the voters. And we passed an initiative back in 2012 that had the highest percentage of votes of any initiative in the history of California. That's how much the community understands what this human modern day slavery is. And when the question was asked, why do people do that? Why do they hold someone in servitude? Why do they treat human beings like they're human ATM machines? The answer is, for many, they're, they're sociopaths. 
And I don't say that lightly, because I do a lot of research around this. And the truth is, a sociopath is a person who doesn't have human empathy. It's not part of their DNA. And so they can treat people like they're slaves or treat, treat people like chattel for their own benefit. And as, as uh, Deanna pointed out, that so many of these cases, especially labor, are done in isolation and in, se in secret, because we don't get to go into people's houses. And it's the people that are very courageous that will speak up, like the young woman in the video did, to the neighbors. We have a lot of work to do. And let me just tell you a little bit about what we've done in Alameda County around human trafficking and sexual assault. Not only have we eliminated the backlog, not just in my county, but we're working on eliminating the backlog of any untested kids so that sexual assault survivors know that they will get justice in whatever form it looks like, but that we will not disregard their, their uh, victimization because it's not convenient or it's not our social uh, uh, priority. The second thing is, and I hope you all will support this, this will be my third time going to the legislature with a bill to mandate law enforcement to submit those kits to be tested. So we're not leaving it to the confusion between, well, I'm the officer and I booked it in the evidence room. Why did the criminalist come and get it? Or the criminalist saying, nobody told me it was it. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Everyone should get submitted. And we, were, we had no, no votes last year, but Jerry Brown vetoed it for unknown reasons. But we're back and we believe Gavin Newsom will sign it. We've trained, we've trained, uh, changed a lot of laws around sexual assault rights and raising the, raising the uh, status and bringing equality to women in, uh, in the criminal justice system, to women in our social support systems, and particularly around human trafficking. So in uh, 2006, sorry, 1996, I had a grant to prosecute cases that involves ex sexual exploitation of minors. And the first case I had was a 12-year-old girl who was being trafficked. I didn't know, I didn't, we didn't call it that, and I didn't know what she was talking about. As she described how every night the trafficker would come and literally pull her out of her house where she lived with her mother and her sisters and put her on the streets of Oakland and sell her nightly. Sometimes 10, 12 people would buy her nightly and rape her. We, when when uh, we, it came to my attention, the police had saved her, rescued her from a 50-year-old man who had paid to rape her and a 39-year-old trafficker. Both were arrested and I prosecuted him. And when I started hearing what this young little girl was telling me, and then we started working with adult women who were engaged in commercial sex and talking to them about, well, when did this, when did this happen for you? When did this exploitation begin? And this research that we've done in Alameda County, we now have 70% of the women that we're working with who are adult women who are on the street or in a brothel, 70% their exploitation started when they were children. So we cannot ignore the fact that we have a lot of work to do with our children to make sure that we have equality and justice for all women and adults. The other thing that we've done is created a, an a research institute called HEAT Institute. HEAT is Human Exploitation and Trafficking, and that's the initiative in my office. It's five components. One of them is prosecute cases, because we have to get traffickers out of circulation. And I'm proud to tell you that my office has prosecuted over 600 human trafficking cases in the last six years. It's wonderful. It's great. We have, uh, we've done over 5,000 safety plans for youth and young adult. 99% are women or girls. Uh, we also, the second component is to train law enforcement to see what is their role in addressing human trafficking. And not everybody wants to be involved with the police, but our, our Family Justice Center has a human trafficking component to it so people can get services and not have to be engaged with the justice system. The third one is to support our community-based organizations, just like the Asian Women's Shelter, to make sure that they're strong and healthy to provide services that are appropriate for that particular survivor. The fourth one is to change our policies. And since this WIT initiative, we've changed the laws. When you change the laws and you get data, you drive resources. And there's a tremendous amount of money now committed in our community. And the last part was engaging our community. And this is the place where I'm going to um, come a little bit to the end. 
uh, just in the interest of time. And that is that uh, our community, as, as uh, you saw on the slide, that it is, this is not for law enforcement to solve. This is not for, this is, a, this is a social issue that all of us have a responsibility and a call to action. One way that we're able to do that is by letting people know what human trafficking is. In the back, you can see one of our billboards, uh, posters, which we do every January. And what Polaris Project, the Doug Brunson National Hotline tells us is that when we do our billboards, the calls from the Bay Area, which is one of the 10 hotspots in the United States for human trafficking, both of domestic trafficking and international trafficking, that those calls go up like 25, 30, 40 percent because people are paying attention. So we educate the community of what does human trafficking look like, and we actually have a law, and I hope you will look it up or be involved with us, and the law came was SB 1193, and it says that there's a poster that needs to be put up in certain businesses, and the poster tells people what human trafficking, what are the signs of human trafficking, what, a, what does that look like, and the big, what's the hotline number. It's designed for people who may be being trafficked, like the young woman who came out to walk the dog, if she was in one of those businesses that required the poster to be up at her time, she could have read that and said, wow, this sounds like my life. Or with girls that are, and young women and women that are on the street sitting at a bus stop for a little shelter, looking at our bus shelter, I mean our bus um, billboard thing, is they're looking at it saying, oh, that looks like me. This sounds like my life. How can I call for help? The other thing it does is people like us, to read that when you go into a restaurant or into the hospital, the emergency rooms, or go to all of the businesses and look at that and say, wow, you know what, that looks like my neighbor's person who is her housekeeper who only comes out of the house once a day or something. And so really this, in my county, we created an app for our community to just plug in, Map 1193. I do this when I go to restaurants in Alameda County and Contra Costa. <laughs> Map 1193, well here I'm at Denny's. Let me see, I don't go to Denny's, but um, let me put in and see if Denny's has, is in compliance because I don't see it. And if it's not, I push the button that says, you're not in compliance. That will send us out to that restaurant and say, this is the law. And if you don't do it, and this is the real kicker, because most businesses don't particularly want to hang it. The real kicker is it's a $500 fine for the first day and it's $1,000 for every day after. So we say, where would you like us to put it? And guess what? They put it up. And now we had to make our app foolproof so that businesses could go through and say, green, green, green light, I'm in compliance. Um, but I, you know, I invite you to learn more about it. But in the end, we've got work to do, no question about it. But when we change the face of our leadership in this country, in our co local communities, when we work together as community to right the wrongs that go on, and we insist that we have justice systems, whether it's criminal justice, civil justice, family justice, we insist that our justice systems are not prejudiced against women or against vulnerable populations, then we will change the paradigm of these crimes and bring the equality to women uh, that we all want and that women deserve. Thank you. office, but he has spent the past 20 years overseas, uh, primarily with UN peacekeeping missions, including 10 years in Afghanistan and anti-corruption. Um, he's prosecuted war crimes, rape, and uh, is crown prosecutor in the Solomon Islands. So, Michael. to show that 
however bad it is here, unfortunately, in most developed countries, it's a lot worse. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, recently there was a study done by the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security in Oslo, Norway's Peace Research Institute. The 10 worst countries for women in the world, number 10, Niger, number 9, Sudan, not South Sudan, the new country, but Sudan, uh, 8, Mali, 7, Iraq, you can see the United States spending trillions of dollars didn't have too much effect there, uh, 6, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, 5, Central African Republic, 4, Pakistan, the fourth worst, Three, Yemen, the third worst. Second, and as I was there 10 years as the chief of rule of law for UNAMA, the peacekeeping mission, you can blame me for part of this. Uh, second worst is Afghanistan, and the worst is Syria. That is for women, and that takes into account not just general discrimination, whether it's business or everyday life, but especially violence against women. And now, let me say that my comments, I have to say this, are those of my, of my own personal beliefs and experience and does not reflect the San Francisco District Attorney's Office. I spent 15 years there when I had black hair in the 80s and 90s uh, as a prosecutor ending up uh, doing prosecutions of rape and uh, pimping, what we now call trafficking in persons, uh, as well as some murders. Then I went overseas for 20 years, primarily with the UN, as you heard, and I'm happy in the question period to answer questions about other places I've been and prosecuted, including prosecuting sexual assault rape cases, uh, five in Solomon Island in, in Kosovo, uh, two years in Solomon Islands, three years in Bosnia, a year in South Sudan, a year in Indonesia, but I'm going to focus here in the seven minutes I have left because we want to give you time for questions for the entire panel uh, about what's going on in Afghanistan. Uh, the U.S. has spent over two trillion dollars on Afghanistan since 2001 and 0.0005% of that, or $1 billion, the billion dollars sounds a lot bigger, uh, was spent on working on rule of law in the criminal justice system, and only a portion of that in terms of violence against women and how the system treats women. You might remember that back in 1996 and 2001, the Taliban, a fundamentalist religious uh, Sunni group, uh, ran the country. Uh, women were not allowed to go to school. Women were not allowed to work. Women were enforced to wear uh, the burqa that my colleague and uh, UNASF uh, board member Arya in the back there uh, demonstrates uh, with some posters and the actual burqa. Uh, the burqa has a very, very small area in which women could look out of, and there is mesh there. The reason why it is so tunnel vision is so their brother, husband, or father can see whom they're looking at and what they're looking at while they're outdoors. Uh, I was frankly very disturbed that when the uh, De Young University, sorry, De Young Museum in Golden Gate Park did a otherwise interesting exhibit that just ended on modest Muslim dress while they showed uh, $10,000, dollars gowns by Dior and by French fashion houses for princesses in Qatar. They did not explain that in many Islamic countries, and in particular Afghanistan, thanks, sorry, uh, you had women who were forced, whether they liked it or not, 
to wear the burqa. I hired women lawyers to work for me in the UN, and they would have to wear in the capital urban city of Kabul uh, the burqa from their homes to when they got to the UN compound. They would then quickly shed it, and they would wear what you might see in movies, uh, it's what's called a shower kameez, sort of a very long, loose shirt covering down to the thighs and baggy pajama pants and a scarf over the head that actually can show hair. Uh, that's what they felt comfortable and that's what the uh, Western women wore as well or the, from the Far East in the UN. My point is that uh, I was very unhappy that that other side was not shown and it was pretended, I think, that this is all a choice and you shouldn't criticize it. I understand the PC nature of that but it isn't real because I know from the women that I hired who were lawyers that they didn't like it, but they had to wear it or else they would get in trouble. Uh, to talk also to talk back on Afghanistan. So what's happening there? Well, unfortunately what's happening is uh, two thirds of Afghan girls don't go to school. 87% of Afghan women are illiterate. 70 plus percent of Afghan women are required to marry in forced marriages. 80% of the suicides in Afghanistan are women, which is a clash with the majority of countries where more men commit suicide than women. 90% of women in Afghanistan experience some form of family or domestic violence. And how does the justice system that I worked with deal with that? Well, the laws right now are pretty good. They're, all, they're better than some states in the US when it comes to domestic violence, trafficking in women, and such things. I have worked on that with the government, and the government said, sure, we'll pass this. The president did some decrees because they believe in it. However, like in many places. The actual crux of the matter was the application of those laws was such that women continue to be victims. A recent, you can look at it if you Google UNAMA, U-N-A-M-A, -A, that's the UN peacekeeping mission. You, if you Google UNAMA violence against women 2018, the latest report shows that 61% of the murders of women and a higher number of violence against women not resulting in murder, including acid attacks, including uh, burning women, uh, those were not even going through the courts like the law required. They would be mediated by jurgas or shuras, which is the community getting together, mostly run by old dudes with beards, and they would mediate and find solutions. Indeed, the solutions resulted in such things as requiring rape victims, especially underage, to marry the men who raped them. The resolutions did not punish the men who, who murdered their wives, for example, in any significant degree. Uh, so the law is good. The law says child marriage cannot be unless you're 16 or 15 with the uh, permission of your parent. By the way, that law is better than 25 United States. Okay, think about it. Including, of course, Florida. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to pick on just Florida. But my point is, it's not as good. California has better. Thank you, Nancy, I'm sure you had something to do with that. But the point is, that is what's going on in the law, but in reality, you have what's called a practice of bad, where if I am a man and I run over my neighbor's sheep by accident and I kill a bunch of them, when the jerk of sure gets together, one of the things that they can do and do is say, well, we have to give you compensation. And the compensation often is a younger daughter that is given from the driver's family to that of the uh, 
person who has lost his sheep, okay? Uh, that's the type of thing that's going on. The lack of application that's fair is shown by the fact that Afghanistan is a country where primarily because of uh, religious reasons, the Quran, which does not allow uh, un and the hadith and other cultural aspects, do not allow uh, people who are unmarried to have sex with each other, and obviously do not allow adultery. Uh, the fact is that 90% of the detainees in the jails, in the prisons, are women. Why? Because one of the things that husbands do and can do is to divorce a woman, but if they divorce the woman, the woman gets back the dowry, which is quite substantial, that her family gave to the both of them. The husband makes the complaint, the good old boy network works, the police arrest the wife, then he goes and says to the wife, you want me to drop the complaint? Sign this piece of paper that says, I get the dowry. The dowry doesn't go back to your parents. And that is one of the reasons why the husbands make the complaint. In the first place, the woman didn't do anything. It's probably the husband. Uh, the forensics are awful when you talk about forensics. The American uh, government tried to help, we tried to help, but you have, for example, a minister of justice uh, who did not want to budge with the fact that virginity tests are given, not just when any woman goes into prison, but when a woman goes into a government-run women's shelter. Why? Theoretically, it is because we want to make sure that if they complain that the jailers or those that run the government shelter rape them, we want to find out if they were virgins in the first place. Because they have the stupid and completely wrong medical idea that if the hymen is broken, that means you have had sex, as opposed to the multiple other reasons why it might happen. And the testing of rape is absolutely we try to get this changed, and it is some doctor who knows nothing about modern methods and who says, we will see, and I'm sorry to be specific, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and others, but uh, I have to say this, is to use the finger test. They do this in Pakistan when I was there too, which is, well, if they, one finger means they have had sex, Two fingers means they may have had a child. Three fingers means they're a prostitute. And they've actually had convictions, including for having illicit sex for that reason. So yes, the law sounds good. Application is not so good. The women's NGOs are doing all they can. Uh, people like the, uh, the UN, uh, people uh, such as the U.S. government even are trying to help, but there is a long, long way to go. Uh, my, uh, my time is up. There's a lot more that I could say, but I'll wait until questions. We're here to answer your questions, not to simply tell you what we think you want to know. And with that, I thank you again for having me here, and I'm getting the buzz from my Apple Watch, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. So now we're going to move into the portion of the program where we're going to have our panel discussion, and I'd like to ask our speakers to come up and sit in chairs. And also just to remind you again that we do have cars going around if anyone wants to ask questions. We'd be glad to present them to our panelists.
just like to say, can we have a round of applause for the presentation? <laughs> Now, I'd like to bring this back um, home um, because, once again, we, we, I believe we're at a very pivotal time right now for women, and everybody has such unique experiences, and I want to try and bring this all together and really create a synergy and just see how things are connected because we are connected, even though we've spoken about law, we've spoken about trafficking, we've spoken about businesses and things, there is still a connection there where it's, it's societal, it's psychological on how women are treated and spoken to and viewed throughout society. So my first question uh, to the panel is what experience made you champion equality or justice for women in what you do? I'll be quick because I already talked about it. Yeah. And that was experiencing and witnessing injustice and, uh, and then deciding that that would be my pathway in life was to change that. My first uh, corporate employment position was with a pharmaceutical company. There was 10 um, female pharmaceutical reps that were left at the same time. Um, we did not know, unannounced because a regional manager didn't feel like women could do an equal job. And I was, ended up you know, being a contributing author to a book about that, but that was more of a mindset type of thing of just not letting somebody determine what my definition was in the market space. And so I just moved forward from it. Um, I supposed to be a professor. I have a PhD in political science and my parents want me to be a professor. And um, I tried. I actually was a TA, but then it was kind of not that interesting. Um, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> There's a lot of talking. Um, and then uh, I did my uh, PhD in uh, political science in a way, and um, I was working at uh, a new department in the university. And that's when uh, my job was actually to support uh, younger women who had been pregnant and children and come out of school, etc., etc., and navigate the system to get scholarship, to get housing and child care. And when I saw them actually uh, successful, I feel like this is what I want to do. This is who I am. So. I would say I've always wanted to be a prosecutor since uh, undergrad, and the reason for that is because I really believe that if you do something wrong that hurts someone else, then you should be accountable. I also have to say, uh, as a slight personal thing, I've always been kind of shy with women, and one of the reasons why I got very angry at my fellow heterosexual is because I saw what they did in the stories I've heard with what they did with women that they said they went out with. That's pretty public now with the hashtag Me Too stories, but you didn't hear it back when I was in college in the middle, late 70s, and when I started work in the 80s. And when I was on the sexual assault team and when I did domestic violence work, I realized how nasty things were, and so when I could, I carried it on when I was on the So ditto with Nancy's. <laughs> Great, thank you. So being aware of the bias women face, how has that changed how you present your work or communicate with other organizations you have to work with? energy and I did things so I had I built my credibility but no question that 
that concept for me is if you want to, if you don't want to be talked about or told what to do, be at the table and be one of the decision makers. Um, now, Leticia, this question is specifically for you. What is the difference you've seen your technology make between women and, and men? As far as the test results you're inquiring, so that's a common question. Um, between gender, there is not that much of a difference. But what you'll see is you'll see within um, culturally, so if it's an Asian culture, you'll tend to see that they'll score a little bit higher because they believe like diet impacts their overall health more. Um, Indian populations, even though the vegetarians were extremely, extremely low in the lowest category possible, um, part of that has to do with our food sources and really the lack of nutrients that's in our food today. Um, the other part of that is that you will see with men a little bit because they internalize stress more, that that can impact their score, and that's part of the things that cause oxidization. But even as we talked about the couple of case studies up there, What's different from the female perspective is that females really garnish and control 85% of the healthcare decisions. And what they'll do, like with that case study with 5,000 women, is that at the end of their pregnancy, they actually continue to stay on therapy and brought their husbands in to go on it as well because they wanted to make sure that their family network was taken care of. And so you'll see that continuation on of education that they've received, which is one of the reasons why we need to continue to empower and support women. And this question for the whole group, uh, what is the most challenging aspect of your work when you advocate for women? So uh, there's a lot of roadblocks in our work in anti-violence until today. Uh, there's still a lot of denial uh, about violence in, uh, in the anti-domestic violence work. You know, even though domestic violence is older in the U.S., older sort of starting in the 1960s and today is 2019, many, many years after, there's still denial that domestic violence actually happened. Mm -hmm. uh, in our judges, you know, in our legal system, in our uh, family court, there are judges that don't quite believe that it happened. Um, there are judges in San Francisco, Nancy, you probably know this, that um, uh, still give a lot of visitation, overnight visitation, to a father who obviously, who has been jailed. And, um, or we, we, have, we, have has, uh, we have had cases where a mom is living in San Jose and the father is living in, I don't know, Burden Game or something like that, and the judge actually give uh, four times visitation per week, and it's three hours every time. And with the traffic and everything, then the mom basically can't work. So what kind of system is that, that actually is not supporting one person to actually be able to uh, survive, you know, and you know, be with the children? There's also a lot of still blaming the victim going on. Um, and then, of course, in my world, there's still a lot of racism and anti-homophobia and uh, anti-transphobia. So when a LGBT person is actually experiencing violence, the tendency is to blame them. So in the healthcare space, it's pretty much still predominated as far as sort of on political studies. It's done in Caucasian males. And as far as decision making, a lot of them are older Caucasian males as well. So I agree with Nancy, you know, I had a mentor or sponsor tell me once, you know, 90% of success is showing up. And you do, you differentiate yourself by being educated, making yourself feel comfortable, 5% of the time each day. <laughs> so pushing the envelope a little bit. And that's really how we continue to advocate across the board. Just pass the microphone down yeah. to your recording. So I don't really have too much to add to what talked about other than to say that these decisions are being made about people's lives in spite of the fact that we have written laws to say if there's domestic violence there's a presumption of no of either uh, supervised visitation or no visitation and so it's my frustration is when the law the black letter of the law exists and yet we have people who interpret it differently uh, speaking about overseas Patience 
understanding the true change takes a long time. I found that the UN is pretty good at understanding that. Look at the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, we're looking down to 2030. The US government, not so much. They want something fast. That's why in every country I've been, the laws are the first thing a lot of countries want to change because that's a quick win that they can come back, hey, we changed the law. Now, actually getting those in the justice system to apply the law and changing the attitudes is a lot longer. It took, uh, starting with Farrah Fawcett and the Burning Bed, those of you who are old enough to remember that TV movie, to start the domestic violence uh, change that we see in the United States. So, inviting women's NGOs to take parts is, is a messy process because it's gonna take a lot longer. You have a lot of different ideas. You've gotta gain a consensus. Now, going from the ground up is what should happen, but many times because, hey, we wanna show after a year, we did something and show metrics, uh, it results in overseas development that they don't have the patience. Great. Um, Michael, just please continue to hold on to the mic because I've gotten questions uh, from the audience. Uh, and the first question uh, is, is actually a series. Um, it says, how is Syria number one on the list? And why isn't Saudi Arabia on the list? <laughs> and what is the impact that uh, America has had on uh, Muslim countries? How much of an effect have any of our policies had and the monies that we've spent? How much impact do you think that it's had? On Muslim countries? Okay. First of all, it's not my list, okay? It's a list put together by the groups I mentioned. I'm guessing Syria is number one, as opposed to, say, Saudi Arabia. Because any time you have a breakdown in the civic structure, that means a breakdown in, I hate to use these words, I'm not Richard Nixon, a breakdown in law and order. What happens is, it's easier to do crimes against victims and not have any accountability. So I would suppose, I've never been there, that if a woman is raped in Saudi Arabia, you're going to have a response by the police more likely than if a woman is raped in Syria, which is a huge mess. You have the same problem in Libya, which is why Libya as well is on, I know that from UN colleagues there, the same with Afghanistan. Uh, if you were looking at discrimination, certainly you have discrimination in Saudi Arabia. I remember seeing uh, three women, a picture of three women pilots from Brunei landing a brand new 787 in Saudi Arabia. And once these three pilots landed the plane with all the passengers, they were not allowed to drive a car away to their hotel. If you think about it, there's a little irony there. So uh, the study I gave you is looking not just at discrimination from the standpoint as say what you have in Saudi Arabia, but also, and I'm sure there's a lot of hidden domestic violence there as well, but also uh, the other countries. Uh, second, the money in Muslim worlds. I've been in a lot of uh, Islamic countries. It depends upon the Islamic country and what that government and how strong the civil society is to put to effect what the money is doing and where the money is going. So where you have a war zone like Iraq and Afghanistan, the government tends, the US government tends to put a lot of that money. Same with Bosnia and Kosovo. We figured out that there was more money per capita spent on Kosovo than any other country because Kosovo was so small, yet it was in Europe, uh, if you want to call that an Islamic country. Second, I have to say, Islamic countries are very, very different. 
I really don't want to answer that as a group, okay? You've got everything from Malaysia, Indonesia, this is places I've been, to Saudi Arabia, to Yemen, and to uh, Kosovo, which some consider an Islamic country. Uh, so I was quite surprised after coming to Pakistan because no one prayed five times a day, and, uh, and women were dressed sort of like they're dressed here during the summer. So it's, if you will, I apologize if you don't like this phrase, but it was more Islamic light, okay? Uh, in the same way that there are very many degrees, very many levels and uh, different types of Christianity or Judaism or other religions. So it's very hard to answer that question. Okay, great. Thank you, Nancy. This one is for you. It says, what businesses are mandated to hang up the signs related to SB 1193 and what is the app called? The app is called map1193.org and uh, it's right now it's operating in Alameda County and Contra Costa, so we're always offering it. Anything we create in Alameda County, we offer it to anybody else that it, it has the same um, The types of businesses are, there are actually 13 businesses. We've just added a new type of business, which is hotel motels. Uh, so hotel motels are required to hang the poster. Public trans transit places like the bus depot or BART, I see them on BART, um, and the buses that go through the cities. Uh, restaurants, massage parlors, um, healthcare, like, uh, the, like the emergency rooms and the urgent cares are required. So there's, a, there's 13, now 14 businesses that are required to hang this up. And uh, on our website, which is heatwatch.org, it lists all those businesses and it lists how Map 1193 works. We actually, the Attorney General is man, was mandated to create the poster, but we did our own because we did it faster. And uh, so we make that available to any group. And right now in Alameda County, we have days of action where we get a community together, we train them. Kind of what I said, you know, it's a $500 fine, a thousand, where would you like it? Uh, but the other thing is that day in and day out, there's a group of nuns that live in apartments down in the southern part of my county, and they spend every day go into these businesses, and God help those businesses if they don't have that poster up, because those people are not leaving until it goes up. So, you know, this is, everybody can do, anyone in the community can do this. Great, thank you. And actually, I was gonna say, you can hold on to the mic. So, uh, other question is, the 190 million from Congress has been, has it been released to law enforcement, or has it simply been approved? It is actually, has gone out, so, so far, 160 million of the 170 million has gone into the field. The challenge in the beginning was getting law enforcement to ask for the money. And uh, we don't know how many law enforcement agencies have actually asked for that money. We're encouraging them to, we're notifying them, and we hope that they'll do it. Okay, thank you. What Nancy said. Uh, just the app that Nancy was referring to, the, the website, was, is Matt. 1193.com, not .org. So you can get it, and when you do, it'll look like that. Thank you. Okay, and the last question uh, is, is directed toward you, Hediana. It is, what percentage of human trafficking victims are, are men, or forced labor are males? And how do their situations differ from women if they do? Thank you. Um, hello? Yes? Uh, <clears throat> um, thank you for the question. Uh, so our uh, clients are actually male, female, and uh, children as well. So I would say 30% um, of my clients are male. And I think uh, it is because most people probably thought it's Asian women shelter, so people don't want to call, give us a call. So mostly it's our attorneys and community members that are connected to us. So Asian women shelter has <clears throat> has 40, a capacity for 40 languages. 
So we have Russian, Spanish, Arabic, <clears throat> and each language group, each in a group of interpreter work in the community doing you know, education in the temples, in their mosque, whatever. And based on that uh, outreach, people then start calling us. So, so far I would say it's around 30%. And then the work that uh, involve is mostly like construction, uh, uh, janitor work, um, what, uh, restaurant, janitor, cleaning stuff. And my biggest um, uh, case was actually fishermen. There are a couple of, uh, a few fishermen that was brought from places in Asia, was brought to Hawaii. And you probably, you probably all know that when, uh, you know, the fishing industry here actually uh, catch tuna, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, they are not um, required to have employees that have visa. So these people that they recruit in the waters of Hawaii, in the middle of the ocean, they don't have visa to enter the U.S. So they will be trafficked and exploited mm -hmm. in the ocean, mm -hmm. all in the waters of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So my clients were in, uh, were in situation where they only were fed twice in the day, with no um, working with no what you call protective gear, got hurt, sick, etc., etc., and they couldn't run it, uh, or jump into the soil of the U.S. because they are uh, afraid. So the ones that actually ran away, they just change it. They just do it because they are desperate. But fishing is probably one area that we barely hear about. So think about where your fish come from. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Well, that concludes our panel. Um, I'm sorry we missed a couple questions, but uh, please, a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy, really. Uh, thank you all. It was very, very illuminating. It's us hope that there will be justice for especially the underserved and underprivileged in our society. And hopefully, we're showing you the way to achieving equality for women today. Uh, there are so many other organizations who would like to join with us, and uh, we will continue this series throughout the coming years. Uh, I would like also to, to know that we have a surprise. We have two extraordinary musicians who play, each play the viola. They are sisters. Uh, they are uh, Christina Simpson, who is a violist in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, she began playing at the age of six and attended San Domenico School of Virtuoso Program. She also performed in the concert halls across Europe, as well as Davies Symphony Hall and the Walt Disney Concert Hall. She currently serves as a principal violist for several orchestras. Her sister, Alexandra of Pierre Simpson, is a violist and chamber musician in San Francisco. She received her degree in viola performance from the New England Conservatory of Music studying with Kim Kashakashan, and went on to pursue a master's in artist diploma at the Yale School of Music. She is currently working on a professional studies diploma at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, and I want to thank especially Nahid Arya back there, who uh, brought <laughs> Yes, please join us and thank you again. You're welcome to join you.